Good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome to another edition of your Bitcoin economic calendar, where we cover the news you need to know for the week ahead in Bitcoin. Today is Monday, December the 7th, and we have lots to cover today. Huge week of economic data ahead for the US dollar. That seems to be driving all markets. So we're going to talk about how that can impact Bitcoin and equities in general. We're also going to talk about how you can use Bitcoin to spot when a central bank is misrepresenting exchange rate information. This can come in handy in the future. And we're also going to talk about how Square and PayPal are now buying uh, an estimated 100% of all newly mined Bitcoin, according to some studies. We're going to talk about how this can impact price as well. This and more in today's analysis. Starting as we usually do with Bitcoin, we see that last week was a pretty good one. We started the week out with a bang, rising on November 30th and actually visiting and surpassing all time highs on Tuesdays uh, on Tuesday. But we uh, same day, we actually came down all the way um, really quickly to test the $18,000 levels. However, these levels were met with some heavy buying. And I wanted to zoom out to the daily chart to basically show you guys this pattern that goes from around the 17,000s up to 20. And now it's staggering around the 19,000s, uh, mid 19,000s level. In some trading circles, this is known or as an accumulation pattern. And coincidentally, uh, Michael Saylor came out on Friday end of day to announce that his company MicroStrategies had purchased an additional $50 million worth of Bitcoin at an average price of $19,427 per Bitcoin. This brings MicroStrategies treasury holdings to 40,824 Bitcoins, which represents approximately 19 or 0.194 or 20 base points of Bitcoin's total supply. Now, some of these institutional investors have uh, the conviction of feverish holders and they are averaging in undeterred by price action. Additionally, a recent report by Pantera states that based on data from ItBit, it is estimated that Square and PayPal are now buying roughly 100% of all newly mined Bitcoin, with PayPal estimated at buying approximately 70% of all that newly mined Bitcoin. Um, miners are often painted as the natural sellers of Bitcoin, and with their supply being accounted for on the buy side, this can put um, upward pressure on order books and drive prices higher. All of this added up to Bitcoin closing the week. Uh, I'm just going to zoom out here to the weekly chart so that we can appreciate that a little bit better. So all of that added up to Bitcoin closing the week uh, up 6.45 percent at 19,375. Um, we have a huge week of economic data ahead for the U.S. dollar, and um, this seems to be driving all markets. So we're going to talk about how this can impact Bitcoin and what that data is um, in uh, throughout the episode. Now, moving over to the S&P 500, as uh, we do after Bitcoin, we um, talk about the S&P and Bitcoins as being a story of the dollar. So today I wanted to show you uh, so that we can compare and contrast price action in the dollar relative to the S&P 500. So what you're looking at here is the dollar index. You can see that it has a very clear downtrend. And what you're looking up here is the S&P 500. You can see that it has a pretty clear uptrend. Now let's try something else. Now, what I've done here is I've placed the S&P 500 in the same graph as the uh, dollar index so that you can see the relationship or the inverse relationship, because sometimes a picture speaks uh, more than a thousand words. And this really shows how dramatic um, their relationship is. So investors see the dollar falling and they're looking for places to shelter from inflation. Barring headwinds from any end of the year repositioning around equities, we can expect investors to continue on this trend for the near future. As we mentioned just recently, we have a slew of economic data out of the US this week, including inflations. And markets will be looking to see if inflation remains low, which means that the Fed has to keep its foot on the gas. As a reminder, the last reading for inflation for October came in at 1.2%. And the Fed has vocally said that they need to bring it to 2% plus in the future to meet their goals. Moving over to gold, we see that it had a decent recovery week, closing the week at 1,824 and gaining back 2.84%. Still not fully back from the 4.43% that it had lost the week prior. Now, although it is comforting to see price action consistent with a falling dollar, it is important to keep uh, to have more context in mind. Gold was trading at around $1,500 announced prior to March 12th and it rallied to 2,000, which represents 
roughly a 25% rally in a very large market. The price action that we're seeing recently perhaps reflects investors taking profit and rotating to more risk on trades that have higher upside potential. Like for example, uh, they represent an inflation hedge and a call option on something else like equities or Bitcoin. Historically, investors look at the ratio between copper and gold prices. So industrial versus precious metals as a good indicator between people looking for higher economic activity in the future or people preparing for perhaps uh, lower economic activity. This price ratio, gold over co uh, copper over gold, has been moving higher um, recently. And this narrative around the economic recovery in 2021 seems to be strengthening. We may continue to see similar price action in the near term. Moving over to the DeFi index, we see that contrary to what we had expected last week, the DeFi index actually outperformed ETH and Bitcoin to the upside this week, rallying up 9.09% compared to Bitcoin's 6.45% rally, uh, rally and Ethereum's 4.59% uh, rally. So this was likely due to strong catalysts that were announced uh, throughout the week for the sector. One of them being that Visa announced that it would be uh, working closely with stablecoin issuer Circle and USDC, uh, the stablecoin that we support here at Ledin, to integrate it into some of Visa's services. Additionally, Fireblocks, a well-known institutional custodian, announced on Monday that it would allow clients to tap into DeFi. This likely drove speculation uh, volume into the sector. And with some investors may actually having been short the sector, this could have caused a short cover rally that pushed DeFi to outperform the two main protocol assets being Ethereum and Bitcoin. We will keep an eye uh, going forward to see if this momentum can be maintained or if it's going to fade and continue underperforming the protocol level assets. So in today's market trends section, we're going to talk about how you can use Bitcoin to spot when a central bank is misrepresenting data. Now, before we start, I'll start by saying that not all central banks are created equal. While some try to be more transparent, there are others that deliberately try to fool its citizens and game the global financial system using very old tricks. In the past, central banks were able to control the information available to the public and therefore control local and foreign op public opinion much more easily. With the advent of Bitcoin and publicly available P2P exchange data, central banks have been left with nowhere to hide. Now, why would a central bank lie about its exchange rate or government? This is a great question. And the answer is to help its friends at the government look good and stay in power. It is commonly known that when a bank, uh, when a central bank gets in bed with the government, very bad things happen. Let's, ex let's explain how this works and why they would do this. Let's assume that a radical government takes over and forcefully starts enacting short-sighted economic policies to go against its political enemies and further its agenda. Well, these economic actors that are being prosecuted will look to protect their capital and sell any local currency possible to hold harder to seize assets such as US dollars or Bitcoins in foreign bank accounts. This pushes up inflation locally which dwarfs investments in the local economy and actually hurts its citizens. Now, let's assume that the government doesn't want to look bad. Then what does it do? Well, it commonly decides to set the price for dollars, preventing anyone else from selling them, effectively controlling the price for the dollars. What does this accomplish? Well, let's just say that the new government wants to show the world how uh, all the good that it is doing for its citizens. And let's say it decides to set the minimum wage at 3,500 pesos. And it sets the exchange rate at $1 equals one peso. Well, you know, all of a sudden you have a $3,500 minimum wage, which looks great for all development metrics. But the problem comes when people, like <clears throat> everyone does not have access to that exchange rate, uh, where one peso equals $1. Only the government's friends have access to this exchange rate. In the real market, or the P2P market, the dollar will find its actual exchange rate, the rate at which real people in the local economy are willing to part ways with their dollars uh, for an equivalent amount of pesos. So let's say that this rate in the open market is 100 pesos per dollar. Well, suddenly 
your amazing minimum wage is no more than a mere $35 per month. Um, this is the real economic value of your salary, despite what the government is trying to tell the international community. However, by setting the official exchange rate, the government can not only try to fool its citizens, but it can fool the international community by doing so. It can show artificially high wage numbers and artificially high economic activity, overstating its entire gross domestic product. Now, on to an example. How to use Bitcoin to tell when a central bank is misrepresenting their data and calculate by how much they are doing so. To use an example, we're going to use the example of Argentina. As you can see, the article behind me is recent and speaks about how uh, basically uh, inflation fears or devaluation fears are stopping uh, foreign investment. So let's, let's, let's talk how, what, how we can basically accomplish this. As we mentioned, Bitcoin has left all central bank emperors naked and using publicly available data, anyone around the world can now determine when central banks are misrepresenting the data. For this, we need three pieces of data. Number one, we need a reference US dollar to Bitcoin price, which we can get from uh, Coinbase or any other major exchange. Uh, for the purposes of this example, we're going to use the exchange rate of 19,240. That was last night for this exercise, just so that we can go through some round numbers. The other piece of data that we're going to need is the official US dollar exchange rate provided by the central bank's website. So here we're going to the Argentinian Central Bank's website and we see that the exchange rate listed is 87.17 pesos per dollar. Again, this is the page from the Central Bank of the Republic of Argentina. And lastly, what we need is a reference price for local currency price of Bitcoin in a P2P market in the same country. So in this case, <clears throat> we're going to use local Bitcoins in Argentina. And we see here that we have a bid for 2,935,000 pesos. Now, how do we calculate this? So the first thing we do is <clears throat> determine the price, uh, the US dollar price per Bitcoin. So as we said, in, the, uh, in this example, we're going to use 19,240. It's just a few dollars off for the price you see today, which was the price that was last night when we determined or did the numbers for the exercise. Second, we go and get the exchange rate from the Central Bank of Argentina, which is the 87.17 number that we see here. And lastly, we go to find the local price per Bitcoin in local Argentinian pesos. So here is uh, what we're seeing. Now, once we have these three pieces of data, we can go on to the calculation. So based on the price of Bitcoin in US dollars, and based on the, uh, the 19,240, and based on the central bank's exchange rate of 87.17, we get that theoretically the price of Bitcoin should be 1,679,000 pesos per Bitcoin in the open market. What you see when you go and try to actually buy a Bitcoin in Argentina is that you, can, um, you have to pay nowhere near that. You have to pay actually uh, astronomically more. Uh, 2.935 million. So what does that mean? That means that to get the same economic value of a dollar, an Argentinian has to part ways with many, many more pesos than the central bank claims. According to the, so to basically to obtain the real exchange rate, what you do is you divide the local price for Argentina, this 2.935 number, and you divide it by the $19,240 that a Bitcoin actually costs in a open and transparent market like the US dollar pair. And what you, what you do, the number you get when you do that is that the exchange rate in Argentina should actually be 152.3 Argentinian pesos per US dollar. Nowhere near the 87.17 rate that is claimed by the government. If you divide the 152.3 rate, that is the actual rate, and divide that by what the Argentinian Central Bank claims their exchange rate is, you get essentially the overstatement percentage factor that the Argentinian Central Bank is using. So basically, if you divide 152 by 87, you get that the Argentinian Central Bank is misrepresenting its exchange rate to the tune of 174.73%. So 
from this data, we can tell that the Argentinian Central Bank is actually misrepresenting its exchange rate to the citizens and to the world. It's no surprise that inflation continues to skyrocket here, as we can tell from the articles noted. And uh, essentially, it's also no surprise that Bitcoin adoption is advancing at lightning speed in these markets. So with the tools that we went over today, you too can determine when a central bank is being honest. Moving over to our Bitcoin mining difficulty commentary, we see that not, not much has changed on the difficulty front since last week. We're still sitting at 19.16 terahashes. And the next difficulty adjustment is on track for next Sunday evening. Currently, difficulty signaling a relatively flat adjustment after having signaled much higher last week. We will keep you informed of any relevant changes throughout the week uh, through our social media accounts. So as always, we wrap up with what's ahead for the week. The week ahead is loaded with U.S. economic data every day of the week. While some uh, data releases will be more important than others, market participants will be likely zeroing in to all of them for clues. On Monday, we get consumer credit. On Tuesday, we get productivity and unit labor costs. On Wednesday, we get job openings and wholesale inventories. Thursday is absolutely huge. We get jobless claims and consumer price indexes. So that's the inflation reading that the Fed is looking for. And we also get the federal budget. Then on Friday, we close the week with U.S. consumer sentiment reading. Now, as we've mentioned here at length, the U.S. dollar seems to be driving most markets. And the data coming out this week will be what the Fed is looking for to plan its next steps. Investors will also be looking for signs that the Fed needs to keep its foot on the gas. That means low rates and aggressive lending plans. <clears throat> this would equate to an inflation reading that is moderate. And as a refresher, October inflation came in at 1.2% and the Fed has vocally said that they need to get it over 2%. That is a long way to go. Now, on the Bitcoin and crypto world, we had a lot of debate last week around the Stable Act, the proposed bill that would require stablecoin issuers to register uh, with central bank uh, with bank charters. Sorry, this seems unre uh, unrelated to the regulation that Brian Armstrong had alluded to in his tweet thread two weeks ago. Now, although this new Stable Act bill uh, is still in the very early stages, we are seeing a lot of activity out of the U.S. trying to get active and regulate this space. We will continue to monitor any developments and discuss any implications in the coming issues. And as always, we will keep you posted of any relevant news throughout the week from our social media accounts at HODL with Ledin. If you don't yet have a Ledin account, I invite you to check Ledin.io and learn how you can earn 6.5% on your Bitcoin and 117 on your USDC. Thanks, everybody. And if you learned something today, please like, share and subscribe. See you next week and hope you have a great one.